All right, let's get started this morning. I have a, a couple of announcements to begin. Housekeeping things. We've heard a lot of people are having headaches. That's because we are at 8,300 feet and you're probably not used to it. So there's actually a really good two solutions to that problem. Uh, the first one will happen tomorrow, which is to go down on an elevation. <laughs> Uh, the, the thing that actually works really well is drink more water than you imagine you need. So he, hydration is actually critical in getting over, overcoming that. So feel free to just keep drinking and drinking and drinking. Uh, second, um, uh, as many of you may know, uh, uh, I'm working with some people uh, to create uh, something we're calling the Markets and Management Interest, Interest Group in the Academy of Management. As part of that process, we've developed a draft domain statement and as, part, as additional parts of that process, we need to get signatures of people who said they, they would likely become members of the Markets and Management Interest Group if it was approved by the Academy. Uh, and so uh, what we've done is, Teresa, one more time, has come to the rescue and, and we have printed out copies of the Markets and Management Domain Statement Draft. And, and uh, attached to those are uh, a place where you can sign if, you're in, if you would be willing to do so as a petition to, to the Academy of Management. We want to keep the, they're, they're stapled together, we want to keep them stapled together because that's the way you have to deliver them to the Academy. Okay. So that's my um, um, housekeeping, anything else, Todd? Okay. All right, we have a great session for us this morning. It is on how do we link theory and practice and strategy. That's one of the issues that we have always Practice has always been central to what we do in the field and now, but, but, um, but how, how can we do that more effectively? And we have a great panel, so Martin. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Jay told me actually that um, when, I, when we go down the valley, I'm going to feel like a superman. I, I would have preferred to feel like it for this session, but you'll have to do with the, uh, the suboptimal version. Um, so as part of the reflection on the, uh, the health of the field, we're going to change gears slightly and look at the, uh, the link between theory and practice, or maybe the strongest statement would be the relevance of, of, of theory uh, to practice. So the, uh, the sort of questions that we'd be, uh, like to explore with you are, uh, should theory uh, serve practice? It sort of sounds obvious, but I have heard dissenting voices to that proposition. Does it currently do so effectively? Uh, if not, why not? And, and how can it do so uh, more, more effectively? Um, so yesterday there was, uh, uh, several of the speakers said, uh, you know, it's all about having the best questions. Actually, if we could generate some answers, that would be wonderful in, as to how to move the field uh, forward in, in this respect. Um, so we've got, I think, a very uh, well-qualified panel to explore this question. Um, so the common denominator is that um, each of us has uh, spanned uh, at least two of A, B, and C. Um, and uh, so I, I basically used to do strategy in a chemical company, and then I uh, did strategy for, for 20 years at uh, a consulting group uh, practicing uh, strategy projects, and um, now lead uh, research inside a consulting company uh, on, on strategy. Um, Richard, um, who many of you know, is an academic who has written about the profession, the, the business, uh, the, the, the history of strategy. Um, Zia Yusuf um, is a former colleague from BCG, but he's uh, been a, a startup CEO as well as a strategy consultant, um, has done strategy in large companies like Cisco and most recently uh, VMware. And uh, JT has been a, a strategy consultant um, and also recently, until very recently in fact, a CEO of a, a mining AI startup, whatever the intersection between those two fields um, is. Um, so let me um, kick off with a few remarks. Um, so before I explore the, the potential for improvement, I mean, obviously this is not a black or white question. The, 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 the field, the, the academic field of strategy has, has been an enormous service to practitioners. You, you educate practitioners through MBAs, through executive education. Um, many of you write not just academic works, but popular books which uh, influence the field and introduce new concepts. Um, several of you run different initiatives um, uh, over the years to, uh, to connect uh, theory and practice. Uh, Miles has the practitioner committee at SMS, and uh, uh, Jeff and, and Michael with the new um, strategic management review initiatives is trying to link theory and practice. So there's a lot of good stuff going on, but can we do better? Um, let, me, let me offer a personal point of view. So to me, it, it, it obviously is an applied field. 
and therefore should hold itself to a very high standard in terms of the relevance of the theory uh, to, to practice. So I think if we compared ourselves to um, engineering or medicine, uh, that would be uh, quite appropriate. And um, I think that by that standard, um, I, think, I think we can do better. Um, so here's a, uh, there isn't actually very much data about the perceived relevance of, 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 of strategic theory to practice, but um, here's uh, a survey I carried out of the Hyderabad uh, SMS conference a couple of years ago. Um, necessarily, unfortunately, biased towards um, academics because there were not many practitioners at the conference, and of course that's, that's part of the problem. Um, why, does the, why do the MSMS conferences lack the magnetism uh, and relevance to attract practitioners? Why aren't they the hot places to be? Because there are conferences, if you want to understand um, AI or platform business models, there, there are conferences where you will, you will pay a lot of money as a practitioner to, uh, to, go, to go learn about new things. Um, so this is actually not my opinion. This is, this is the, uh, largely the, 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 the opinion of academics. Um, so uh, does the field currently focus on practitioner-relevant topics? 60% um, of the academics say, no, not really. Either disagree or strongly disagree with a proposition. Um, is the, is the, the output of, of, of a, st a strategy academia useful to practitioners in addressing their key challenges? 81% said, said no. I was, I was quite surprised by the, uh, by the, by the force of the answer. Um, does the field communicate effectively to practitioners? Maybe a little less surprising. Um, so the, the, neither the practitioners nor the academics were, were, great, were great fans of heavy statistical papers in, um, in, in SMJ as being the, uh, uh, the, 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 the pinnacle of communication effectiveness. Um, does it educate effectively on Novel challenges, 60% no, said no. Um, and is there a good interchange? Um, in spite of the absence of practitioners at the conference, is there, in other ways, is there a good interchange between, uh, between theorists and practitioners? 76% uh, said no. Um, we don't have time to go through the breakdowns, but interestingly, the, I think I, um, I got all of the practitioners at the conference, there were 10 of them, and, um, and they were much more positive on the whole, actually. Um, their attitude was more sort of agnostic. Um, it was somewhat interesting to be here, and there were some problems. It was, you were hard, uh, um, the academics were hardest on them, on themselves, on, on, on all dimensions. Um, so the question is, the next question is, um, is, just, is this just a sentiment? Is the field just naturally humble and a little bit paranoid, or, or is it substantive? Um, is it true that practitioner needs are not, uh, as well served as they could be, or as we expect them to be by the field. Um, well, we, uh, we had the chance to do a workshop in, uh, in Hyderabad, and I've done several similar workshops um, subsequently. And um, I, I think there's, the opinions were divided, but the, I'd say the dominant opinion was that uh, this was a substantive issue. Um, uh, I mean, there was a minority opinion that um, this is just a culture of the strategy field, naturally a little bit paranoid and self-critical, it's not really substantive, but the majority opinion was that it was substantive, and um, forget, the, forget the ugly, ugly slide, basically it boils down to the, subs the substantive blockages, I think, um, boil down to, uh, to five things in the perception of the people we spoke to. So the first one was um, focus, you know, what are the at the stage when you know PhD research topics or the next research topic is picked, you know how much does relevance to practice figure as a criterion? Um, not not relevant enough. The uh, the academic shared with us it's mainly about um, you know the fitting in with whatever the will of the department was, being publishable, getting tenure. It was a bunch of things that were not primarily to do with. Uh, relevance to, 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 to practitioners. Um, so that's uh, focus. Uh, I think a second one was flow. Um, interchange between the fields. Um, so actually, um, quite, a, quite a number of, um, of course, p p p strategy PhDs go on to work in industry, um, what I call the crossover community. Um, uh, interestingly, the, the SMS doesn't, doesn't track them. Um, doesn't really, you know, help them with their career opportunities, and so to me, that's a, that's a missed opportunity in terms of uh, because that community you, you thought was the prime candidate for a, for this uh, bridge dialogue and uh, and translating uh, having ideas travel with theory between the the, the two with, with the ideas travel with the people between the the two fields. Um, 
uh, so focus, um, uh, flow. Um, I think another one is forums. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, take, take the average um, session at AOM or, um, or SMS. It's, uh, you know, it's basically serial PowerPoint presentation of a paper uh, by academics for academics. And uh, practitioners, I mean, there are strenuous efforts to have practitioners there, but it's, it's not fundamentally a, a, a friendly format. It's a very difficult format for pra to practitioners to not only feel relevance, but to contribute and feel that they, they are contributing. And um, there are many ways around that. I mean, it's a lot of scope for innovation, I think, in the, in the convening uh, formats. Um, then I think we have um, the, uh, the forum, sorry, that was forums, and then we have communication formats. Um, so obviously there are HBR papers and, uh, and tweets and uh, LinkedIn posts. I mean, the, the field has some popular communication, um, but I think the, uh, you know, the dominant form of communication is, is, is fairly abstruse if we, if we want to be understood, if we want ideas to, to propagate. And so I'm not sure what the answer is here. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tell you some, about some experiments that I've made on, on, on formats in a, in a second. But I think it's something to do with um, how we communicate the, uh, the latest uh, ideas. And then um, something that I'm really not sure what the answer is, uh, is, is the fifth uh, word beginning with F, is, is, is feedback, which is, um, you know, it seems to me that the, the accumulation of topics in the field is, uh, is, is a bit like snowdrift. Things are added, but nothing is taken away. There is, there's no strong selection principle. And therefore, it's actually quite baffling for practitioners to say, well, how do the hundred or so popular frameworks fit together? What, what goes with what? What contradicts what? What should I use in this particular circumstance? The more the field accumulates frameworks, the harder it is to, uh, to, 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 to navigate. So um, I guess that's a sort of a, a knowledge management feedback problem. You know, how do, we, how do we know what we know? What does the field know about what works and what we should focus on and what we should uh, stop focusing on? <clears throat> so in the spirit of, um, of uh, some speculative, uh, ans uh, in the spirit of uh, giving some speculative answers to some of these questions, I think on, uh, on focus, um, why couldn't we have a relevance criteria for um, uh, as one of the criteria for, for um, initiating a research theme, um, for, um, for attaining tenure, uh, for assessing performance. Um, I believe some business schools do loosely, many uh, that I've spoken to uh, don't. I mean, that seems to be a simple problem to fix if we, if we, if we wanted to fix it. Um, if, we, uh, if we think about um, interchange um, and, and flow between the fields, I think, um, uh, I think it wouldn't be so hard to uh, to think about um, secondment programs, to think about uh, career assistance for uh, for people that are trained in strategy to get jobs in industry, uh, to come back to give feedback on the relevance of of, of communications and and ideas. I think we could we could do something on on flow, have the ideas travel with the uh, with the, with the people. I think on t in terms of forums, um, I've experimented with different forums as part of my job, and um, I've had success with. Forums. I think it is possible. I think I've I've showed myself that proved to myself that it is possible to have CEOs, CSOs, and academics discussing strategy theory, uh, you know, passionately and, and willingly. Um, so one of the formats that I've experimented with is um, a, a, a series of dinners called "Bring Your Own Problem" or "Bring Your Own Phenomenon," where essentially a CEO brings brings a problem, um, a difficult one, an uncodified one, and they discuss it uh, with peers and, and academics. That appears to work fairly well. Uh, we have something called the, uh, the meeting of minds that uh, some of you have participated in where we get academics from different fields and CEOs to discuss a big issue of the day like uh, social division or climate change or something like this, trying to bring theory and, and, and practice together. So I think there's a lot of scope for, format, for forum innovation. Um, you know, essentially the question is, um, what would cause a CEO to get on a plane to go to Toronto to the SMS conference because they had to be there to hear about the latest burning issues that are relevant, relevant to them. That's sort of the bar. They're very busy people, but they, uh, some forums clear that bar. Um, in terms of communication formats, um, I think this really, um, I mean, if you think, look at the work of Richard, Richard Feynman, the physicist, um, if you look at the um, Frank Knight's book, um, 
I mean, the, many of the intellectual greats um, thought that it was their obligation to be understandable and not obscure, and they saw absolutely no trade-off between um, rigor and, and accessibility. And um, I uh, have the privilege of serving on the board of the London Institute of Mathematical Sciences, and they have some principles of communication. So even for abstruse mathematical papers, the, per the first paragraph of any paper has to be understandable to, to a layperson. It has to, be, it has to have a, 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 a flesh Kincaid index of what it, whatever it is, 14 or 16. It has to be extremely readable, not jargon laden. And um, so I think, I think there's something we can do on communication. And on, uh, in terms of the feedback loop of the field, the knowledge management of the field, the selection principle, um, I'm not sure, but I'd, I'd love, to, love to hear your ideas. Um, so that's just uh, a little provocation from me, but um, I think Richard has a, an entirely different view or a somewhat different view. Richard, how, how, how do you read the health of the field? Pretty good, actually. Uh, thanks very much. Um, yeah, it's the first time... It's the first time I've ever heard strategy folk described as humble. Um, <laughs> But we are a bit paranoid, and that seems to me to be some of the motivation for this conference. A uh, slight anxiety about our status in business schools and our success as a field. I'm going to be a bit more positive. Yes. Uh, and it's only two cheers, but the cheers there are. I'm also going to be, slightly unusually so far, a little bit empirical but not very, okay? This is a, an early project. Um, so I'm working with Julia Houts at Innsbruck and Christo Panzer at Leeds on the impact that business school strategy researchers have had over the last 60 years on practice. We're doing all right, yeah? So that's what I want to talk about. And I think this is important because some of the doomsaying that we are prone to actually undermines our ability to communicate with practice. If we do not believe in ourselves, why should practitioners follow us? We have got to be more self-confident. There are things we can change, but there are things we should believe in. And I think we've got some room, some grounds, for a little bit of self-congratulation, rather than our dominant mode, which is self-flagellation. Okay, so what we've been looking at is a database that Martin has kindly provided us. That's our starting point. It was something actually that Michael Leiblein uh, referred to yesterday. So that's our starting point. So we're gonna be empirical. And what we want to do is inject a little bit of hope because even Dan Schendel, as Jay said, he's in a way started the field with the Pittsburgh Conference and the SMJ and SMS. Seems a bit doom laden. We've got two academic. The consultants. Yeah, all three of you. Uh, see, see, it's all right. Dan thinks you're a big competitive threat because of the reasons he puts up there. And they're by no means alone. I'm not sure whether Anita's here, but uh, other. Oh, hi there. <laughs> okay, you're hiding over there now. Um, there are plenty of others, influential figures, who have um, exempl uh, uh, illustrated the same sorts of feelings. Yeah? And this leads to some quite radical proposals, more radical even than what Martin was talking about a moment ago. A major shift in how we train our students, with practitioners closely involved, providing the topics, and not advising, but guiding, at least from the sidelines, how they're trained. Indeed, encouraging projects rather than individual work, and so on and so forth. Publication in top journals should no longer be the only criterion, or the main criterion, for tenure and promotion decisions. And still more extraordinary, um, especially in the demands that were put on people like you, um, even more extraordinary that practitioners should be reviewers of papers. 
Are you frightened yet? Yeah. So we need to be careful when we make this. We need to ground such claims on solid empirical facts. Hmm. And that's what we're going to try and do, at least Julio, uh, Christo, and I are trying to do. So we've got three research questions, effectively. What has been the impact over the last 60 years? Has academicization made a difference? And what role do academics play when working with or influencing consultants and other innovators in the field as well as themselves? So those are the sort of three questions that we're going to talk about. Okay, Michael uh, mentioned this database, but basically Martin worked on, uh, gathered uh, a database of 81 strategic frameworks developed over about 60 years based upon practitioner uh, judgment of salience and relevance to the field and attributed each of those um, frameworks to a particular author. Okay, the, the, those of you who follow this field will understand there are lots of quite awkward questions in there, but that's effectively what we do. He was looking, Martin was looking at the rates and types of innovation. We're looking at the sources of innovation, whether it's academics, business, consultants, or a tiny other category of other. Okay, um, the sorts of frameworks, you, well, you recognize them from the ANSOF matrix to sustain, um, whatever it is, transient competitive advantage and so on and so forth. Okay, so these are the sorts of frameworks which we're interested in. Where do they come from? Has academic, uh, uh, the rise of the academic strategy research damaged the academic contribution? And what other roles do academics play in innovation in this field, in terms of field, uh, these things? Well, here's the good news. 64% of those frameworks come from academics. 28% from consultants, business, a small proportion, and a declining proportion. Okay? And then you can see something over time. And this is important because if we take the Dan Shandell idea that there's a kind of race between consultants and academics, and consultants are the ones who are investing most and have a number of competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis academics, it doesn't look as if things have changed very much, even when we become more and more academic. So many of you will remember the Ford and Carnegie reports um, at the end of the 1950s, recommending that business schools move from the trade model to a conventional social science model. Yeah? That could have been the root of all the evils. That was the great strategic error of business schools, in a way, people might argue. No, I don't think that's true. 1971, AOM, BPS, and strategic planning, or whatever it was called, division was founded. 1980, SMJ, and so on and so forth. The consultants weren't sitting on their laurels, resting on their laurels at the same time. They invested too. McKinsey Quarterly, BCG Perspectives, Strategy Institute, the Martin Heads, McKinsey's Global Institute, and so on and so forth. They've invested big time in research as well, in their kinds of research. But what's interesting about this is the academics have maintained their lead throughout that, that 60 years. And consider some of the changes over that period. You know, the the, the so-called Japanese threat, dot-com bubbles, and so on and so forth. An awful lot has changed, but academics have remained ahead. And indeed, in the last period, they were the strongest. That was the best period, 20, 2000 to 2013. Okay? So that's uh, one question, or two questions. I don't think... The academicization of strategy research has damaged us. It certainly helped maintain our lead over consultants who are also investing in research. But how do we work with consultants? We often influence the, co the uh, concepts, the frameworks that consultants produce. Oh, but there are about 18 um, uh, 
frameworks where there's a, a strong interrelationship between academia and consultants in the creation of new frameworks. I was mentioning earlier, we were having a, a chat about PIMS, some of you who remember that, the seven S's and things like that. In a few cases, academics were closely involved in working with the consultants or businesses, in Bin, PIMS case, um, who created these frameworks. So uh, Tom Peters had just left Stanford when he started to dream up the seven F's and in search of excellence, etc. He did his Stanford PhD in OB. And then he worked with academics like Pascal and Athos. They did a, a big workshop together for two or three days and they dreamt up the seven S's. Okay, so literally uh, academics were being used as consultants to the consultants in creating the seven S's, ditto the PIMS. The most common pattern though is, is adaptation. I put um, Martin's adaptive strategy as one of those cases, but I'll take the four phases as one because that goes back to the origins of the strategy field. Strategic management as a concept, as an idea, originated in the 1970s. It was kind of invented by um, a whole set of people, by a small group of consultants who no one's ever heard of, and also perhaps by Dan Shandell, who launched a course in about 1970 on strategic management as a doctoral course. But uh, the, the uh, concept of four phases, where we move from planning through to strategic planning, through to strategic management and something in between, oh, as budgeting started, was the McKinsey way of seeing the emergence of strategic management. It was based upon academic ideas from Ansoff and Dan Shandell. I'll touch on Dan Shandell and Ansoff again in a moment. Okay, and inspiration occasionally happens too. So Foster's S-curve um, came from physics and biology, and that was not from business school research, but from other academic sources of research. Ditto Gladwell's tipping point came from um, the sociology of racial segregation in the 1970s. Yeah, that's quite a big leap, but that's where that came, okay? So, um, the important point of that, that is that strategy academics lead with 70 odd percent of the concepts, but also where they did not lead, they have important and influential roles as well to reinforce academic um, contribution. So, conclusion, Dan, don't worry, you did well. We are doing pretty well. We dominate in framework innovation. And it hasn't made much difference how much we've invested in academic research. So we should be careful. We should be really careful about proposing radical reforms to the business schools and strategy research. Because it's working, it ain't broke. We don't need to fix it too radically, so we should be careful. We do need to understand better about how strategy frameworks are used in the field, and we do need, and I, I'm trying to work on this at the moment, to theorize better to how these relationships work, and I, I draw on Nikolai's work a little bit um, in a paper they did in a handbook somewhere. But it's just two cheers. What we've described so far is history. I think the model, or the system, of innovation and management has worked really well for academics. And it works particularly well because most of this time we've been serving large managerially controlled firms who need to justify, to legitimize their decisions with rational frameworks, or at least the appearance of rationality. And consulting and academics uh, as organizations, we've attracted smart people who've got an incentive to diffuse these ideas. And the leadership, both the wealth and the cultural leadership, the intellectual leadership, has been securely in the West, which prizes individualistic, rationalistic models. Those things are no longer true. Yeah? Entrepreneurially, personally controlled firms don't need to legitimize their decisions. They can be whimsical. They can be intuitive. They don't need to be justified with a rational framework anymore. They might find it helpful, but they don't need it. If you're interested in AI now, you, would you go to McKinsey or would you go to Google, Google DeepMind? You'd go to Google DeepMind. The smart people 
will not necessarily go into academia or consulting in the future. They will go into these extremely powerful, extremely rich organizations who have no incentive to create strategy frameworks or any other framework which will be shared widely, unlike the consultants and the academics. And I think, too, we are facing a cultural shift where, you know, the weird thinking, that's not a political reference, but the sort of Western educated, industrialized, etc., rationalization mode is probably um, less important. So we face a change. I think two cheers. We've done well so far, but we've got some challenges ahead of us. And that's where I'll finish. Thank you, Richard. So I think we want that third cheer, though. So in order to get that, we probably need to calibrate on the reality of uh, strategy practice on the ground. So tell us about strategy in big companies today, Zia. Sure. Well, first of all, good morning, everybody. Um, I guess JT and I are the practitioners that you're going to, that he's, Richard has been talking about and, and so on. So the next few minutes will be a, a little bit of insight from the two of us uh, on that. I must admit, this is a massively terrifying experience for me. Um, because I barely got through business school um, and, and sitting there waiting for that cold call um, uh, with one strategy professor, and I think it was uh, Pankaj Gemawat who was my professor at HBS. And now looking at all of you, it's like, it's, I'm, it's terrifying, just, just, so you, just so you know. Um, but first of all, with, with a little bit of a thanks and, and congratulations to all of you, right? Um, the field, your collective research, over decades um, has shaped how executives, companies, CEOs think about the world. Um, and you do have much to be proud of in, in making that happen. So congratulations on that and, and thank you. And, and for the generations of students that you've trained who've gone on to do amazing things, um, that is due to the work that you've been doing. So let me kind of just start off with that. Um, what I'd like to share, and I think what JD will share, is, is some experiences and insights. Um, I've had 25 plus years of working in various strategy type of roles. Um, at SAP, I was on the leadership team, the SAP, not Cisco, Martin. That's um, SAP, VMware, startups here. I've been in venture capital. Uh, I've been an investment banker. Um, and I was a senior partner at BCG for about seven years doing uh, strategy consulting in, in tech. So it's that collective experience of helping companies, but also being in, in the hot seat, if you will. Um, and what I'd like to share is, is a little bit about, um, in all this talk of frameworks, I've desperately tried to come up with frameworks, um, <clears throat> kind of what I call as the strategic value chain. Right? How, how do you think about, or how, how I've thought about, the, the design of strategy all the way to impact? Um, and that journey is what most leaders kind of think about, not just the upfront piece of it. So maybe starting with just two quick stories, if you will, that I think will illustrate uh, the challenges that, that we go through. And I'll kind of end with five or six insights for your, for your consideration. Um, the first story, and, and these are real stories, um, the topic was around the go-to-market strategy uh, in the mid-market in a certain part of the world. A tech-related company, fairly big decision, um, worth somewhere between 75 and 100 million in, in revenue over two, three years. Um, typical strategy process, two to three months, consultants were involved, uh, pages and pages of appendix, details, frameworks were used, uh, lots of interviews, discussions, what you would expect in a strategic decision of some magnitude. Um, and at that point, um, I was had a head of strategy of, of the organization, so I was leading this effort. And the day before the, the executive team meeting, the CEO kind of sat down with me and said, this is all great, <clears throat> but the head of, of revenue or the head of sales of the organization actually disagrees with what we're trying to propose. And because of that, I'm not going to fight it. I'm going to let it go. It's like, what the hell? We just spent three months with, I mean, this is like, we've got all kinds of data. We've got 300 pages of appendix. How can you just say you're gonna let it go? And, and this answer, which has really struck with me, and this was, was many years ago, was, we don't have to win every battle to win the war. And so in his kind of strategic jujitsu mind, 
that conversation that next morning with his colleague and acquiescing and losing that discussion, which was worth millions, was okay because the week after there was another strategic decision to be had, which he really wanted to make sure he got. And if he agreed to this first one tomorrow, the, the head of sales did not have the ability to say no to the one later. So culture, <laughs> organizational dynamics, massively trumped any logic on the strategy there. And this happens far more often uh, than, than maybe you think or, or you realize. In fact, it's, it's the norm. So that's kind of one, one story there. Uh, and it was very illuminating for me. The second one was a very significant discussion around uh, the transformation on SaaS and cloud from on-premise. So these are kind of tech stories, if you will. Again, a very significant decision for a company impacts every aspect, your business model, how you engage with customers, your product strategy. And so the, the big picture strategy, again, involved consultants. In this case, it was almost four months of work, every part of the organization, big presentation, and so on. And, and we agreed we needed to transition to a you know, SaaS and, and cloud model. That strategic decision, which I think, and I've been kind of listening to some of the sessions here, you would consider, well, that's the strategy with big S. It's at the corporate level, it's big picture, it's, it's the kind of thing that you need frameworks and stuff for. But what happens the morning after, um, it gets super complicated. Because then you have all kinds of other strategies that have to get figured out. And these are as important um, and as relevant as that first kind of Uber strategy. How are you gonna fix and change the product over the next three years? How are you gonna structure the sales force? What are you gonna do with the incentive plans, which is a huge thing? Uh, what are you going to do in terms of the kind of people you need to hire for this kind of business model transformation? Those turned out to be another 15, 20 so-called strategy projects underneath that big picture strategy. And this is not execution. Right? People think about this, well, there's a strategy and then there's execution. I don't think that's true. There's strategy. There's a whole bunch of other strategic conversations and decisions that need to be made. And at that some point, you get to the so-called execution part, if you will. Right? And so kind of the learning there was just because that high-level decision is made with precision and confidence and dependent variables and independent variables and probabilities and so on and so forth, doesn't mean shit. Because the next morning, you have to get through all these other discussions uh, that really drive the, the impact, if you will. So based on a couple of those stories and this experience, I'd like to share with you, you know, five or six things for you to think about because you have a huge potential to continue to drive impact uh, with your students as, as well as the companies. So the first one is strategy is a continuous exercise. It's not something that you do in a strategic project two or three times a year. Yes, if it's I want to enter a new market or I want to get into mobile or I want to kind of acquire something for $50 billion, that's fine. That's what most people think about strategy. But for me, it's much more of a continuous exercise and it has this ladder effect, if you will. There's the Uber strategy, but then you need to think through the, the components of it. The second one would be organizational and cultural dynamics determine strategic impact every single bloody time, okay? no exception. Um, the saying of strategy, it's, uh, uh, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, dinner, if you heard that, that's absolutely true. Um, and within that, we don't talk enough about the incentive structures that exist and need to exist in organizations. So many times uh, strategies have been presented that don't take into account and don't spend enough time thinking through the sales force compensation and structure and incentives, whether they're financial incentives or other incentives. How, what are the incentives for the marketing team that need to change and so on and that drive a culture? 
Um, the third point, uh, agility and speed with a growth mindset, absolutely, absolutely key. Information is flowing so quickly now um, at such speed in so many different directions that uh, perfection doesn't matter. <laughs> It really doesn't matter if you get that extra kind of last 5% there. The agility and speed uh, is, is what, what makes the big difference. Um, next point is experts in any field basically extrapolate from the past. And that is not always helpful. Um, I think there was a comment yesterday on this and I completely agree. Uh, imagination and play uh, is hugely important, uh, especially in an environment with such technological change that you need that disruptive thinking. Um, the only kind of academic experience I've had, I, I spent about four or five years teaching at the design school at, at Stanford, uh, so big into kind of design thinking and desirability and viability and feasibility and so on. Um, and I think increasingly in the last five, six, seven years, there's pressure not to just think within the boundaries of what's happened in the past and what's known, but really step out of that. Um, we had a discussion this morning at breakfast. I mean, Elon Musk was not a rocket guy, had nothing, knew nothing about cars. How did he come up with the fact that you needed a reusable rocket, right? It was that imagination and play that was important. Um, strategic frameworks, Richard. Um, <clears throat> I actually saw that slide for the first time celebrating the number of frameworks that academics have come up with uh, versus consultants. I would just humbly suggest, why does it matter? Um, that's not the measure of success of how many frameworks you've come up with. The measure of success should be how many of them are used and how often and what impact they have in the real world. I don't know how you would do that. You probably need a framework to figure that out. Um, but but that's, that's, the, that's the impact of this. Um, I use frameworks, uh, honestly, very few. Two by two, <laughs> um, SWOT analysis. I mean, things that you would consider kindergarten work in your kind of strategic and academic work. But those are the things that are easy to explain, easy to communicate. Um, Michael Porter, forces, five, seven, how many, I learned in business school, never used before. Uh, Clayton Christensen, breast and soul, uh, innovator's dilemma always comes up, but you don't go back to a framework. So frameworks, consulting firms bring frameworks, they're helpful, but it's not the norm of the way people kind of look at the world. So I just, I, I just kind of encourage you to look at that piece of it. The last one is Gen AI, and I know we have a session this uh, later today, and I look forward to kind of uh, hearing about that. My view, maybe this is also from my technology angle, Gen AI changes everything okay? um, in the following way. Uh, and if you look at it in a pure sense, is Gen AI going to 100% define your strategy and you won't need anybody else? The answer is no. But you don't need to go to that extreme. Just this morning, I was on a call, there was a question that came up about data centers. On the side, I opened up ChatGPT and I asked the question while I was on the call, how would you think about solving this problem? Five, six things came up within seconds. That was good enough for me at that point to contribute and think through this stuff, right? Um, and, and as Sand Alpen once said, the version of ChatGPT or Llama and anything that you're using today is gonna to be the worst one you'll ever use in your life because it's gonna keep getting better and better. And one thing about Gen AI, which, which uh, you can take as a positive or a dramatic negative is I'm involved in a startup um, that's helping companies come up with new innovation and new products. And one of their creations is something called Gen AI Twins, which if you haven't looked at that, read it up. Uh, it is creating synthetic Gen AI Twins of users so you can go create a profile, load on data. I want a, you know, 30-year-old soccer mom, has two kids, or professional, is a CEO, is, you know, for, for, for all of that thing. And then have that Gen AI twin engage with product innovation and ideas in a synthetic way without having to go sit with users. It's like having a group of 30 users in your conference room 24-7 engaging with them. 
So that's fun. The next piece of it, which will impact you potentially, is even more fun. We created Gen AI experts, okay? We needed experts, and this was a shoe company and a car company, experts in uh, rubber technology or lace technology or design. And we even got experts of very famous people. You can go create Gen AI twins of Steve Jobs, of, of other designers, of experts in the field. You just need to load up every single thing they've written, every single speech they've made, so we can create Gen AI twins of every single one of you and have you part of our design and innovation process and have you opine based on your historical insight. No, is it the same as having you in the room? For sure not. Is it 50, 60, 70% of that? Interesting questions to be had, right? So those are the ways I think Gen AI does change things. So hopefully this is helpful. Look forward to having more of a discussion. Uh, and again, thank you for, for your years of, of input into this field. Thanks very much, Leo. So, um, JT, tell us about the small company equivalent to that, the startup equivalent to that. What's the reality of strategy? Awesome. Um, for, before, before I jump into it, I just appreciate being here. Um, I appreciate that this forum exists. And, I, I, and thank you to everybody not just being here, but um, as a University of Utah alum, thank you for joining us here and being part of bringing the U up to, to front and center. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a little bit different. I'm gonna tell a bit of a story here and, and, and share with you my context, share a bit of my journey, and then, and then we can bring that around to how would a set strategy fit into what, what I did, what I've done, what I will be doing. Um, the, so, so, so my story, as I mentioned, begins here in the University of Utah. I'll try and do the, I know we're running short on time, so I'll, do the, I'll try and do the nutshell version. Um, where I started out in math and computer science at the university. Um, and, and uh, you know, in, interesting story is a 23-year-old a decided that this math and computer science thing isn't going anywhere. I better go get an MBA. Um, so you can recover from, from some of your early decisions. Um, I, Went and got an MBA, and then I w went to BCG. Um, math and computer science never left me. And after, after about 10 years at BCG, where I, I got heavily involved in natural resources and had the opportunity to work um, on every continent around the world except Antarctica, some, some of the, the world's biggest companies and biggest assets, um, decided to, to bring it home, and, and BCG was building its AI practice. Um, I had the opportunity to focus a team on building AI solutions for the mining industry. Um, coming out of that, we came up with some great innovations. Uh, a couple patents were recently, a couple of my patents were recently formalized. I, I've seen some pr promotion about that within BCG. Um, but really actually a chance to work on, on cutting edge things on a, on a laggard industry. Um, in doing that, worked my way with a company and found that they had, they had a question for us that said, we've, we've built some interesting things, how do we commercialize it? Um, these, were, these were technologies around understanding the earth better. Um, got into that project as a BCG consultant, realized they had no idea the value of what they were sitting on. As they were thinking about how do I commercialize a technology in the next three years and create EBITDA and dot, 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 and, and these were fundamentally game-changing for the industry. Um, and, and we launched down a path to say, you, you know, yeah, you can commercialize it today, but what you really need to do is spin it out um, and, and build around that and build a company around that. And that was the inception of Veracio. I was asked to lead that. Um, and and that, was, that was a fantastic journey. Um, the parent company I was working for was recently acquired by a private equity firm. Uh, they didn't share my creative vision. And, um, and, and so now that, that, that's headed down a different path. Um, so, so what I'd like to talk about today is, is have, having seen this and being in an environment, uh, and, and by the way, that, that last part of the story, that was within 18 months, right? From see it, spin it out, actually acquire another company, make some strategic moves, and then my 
personal exit and, and frankly, a fundamentally strategic shift for that, that business. Um, so so what, I, what I'd like to share with you is there is an underpinning and strategy in everything that I just talked about. My bad decision as a, as a math computer science student, fortunately stumbling back into it, but, but, but there is an important strategic driver behind that that's built on these frameworks that does not ever get articulated um, and that quickly becomes one that at speed becomes one of, of vision and intuition more than understanding and sitting down in a framework. We have to build that foundation. Um, but, but in the world of technology today, the first place that I'd, I'd like you to go is to understand that the strategy is now being formed on the frontier and led by the pioneers. So I, if, if I just rewind briefly. Walked into, we walked into a large company and we saw they had a technology, the easy answer was to figure out a way to commercialize it. Now, step one of that, that technology and understanding the earth was it was faster and it had a cost advantage, right? Sweet, we can play that game. We could have done that. Step two of it was it could actually do more than the traditional technology. Okay, well, so if I look two horizons out, I might be able to move into some different spaces. Um, step three, was it actually created a different type of data that when, gen when paired up with the AI solutions being deployed in part of the value chain, actually allowed me to unlock the potential of billion dollar manufacturing assets. Step four was actually understanding that allows me to integrate across that value chain, bring data that does not exist today with algorithms that don't yet exist integrate from the exploration phase to better predict the performance of an asset that will exist 20 years later, none of which exists today, but that was the game we're playing on. Right? That, that was the driver of you need to spin this out, you need to take this in a whole different direction. Um, so the strategy that, that we were following, it was, it was understanding signal, but it was being formed on the frontier. Right? And it, when I say the frontier, I don't mean the frontier of technology and what you can observe today. And, and I, you know, even if, if, if we're talking about Gen AI, Gen AI, I mean, we're talking about it here, it's already done. You actually have to be working with the pioneers who are working two, three, four frontiers out from what, you're, what you can see and observe today. Um, that can't be quantified, it can't be measured, you're not gonna run a survey on it. Um, I, hope, I hope the digital twin experts don't catch up with us too soon. Um, but you're, you're not gonna go grab data and, and you need to actually understand what is the signal that they're seeing that I can't quantify, be close enough to them to understand where their intuition is drawing links and then be able to pull that back and capture that and, and frame and structure that. I would argue that that is not happening at large companies. I would argue that that is not happening over multi-year time horizons. Those changes, that, that evolution, those four horizons were developed over the, you know, that was six months. And we iterated at least 10 times in that period. Um, so, so one, and, and you know, what, what's up on the page here, I would actually say, th th these are kind of my ask to you is, is spend less time I, we, and, and I'm, I'm gonna put my CEO hat on, desperately need the workforce to come in with a strong foundation. We desperately need partners who can help translate vision into framework and structure that can motivate and move an organization. Right? I, I, I can motivate an organization. I can't be there in every meeting and every decision. And I need some, I, we need help and structure to distill intuition in, to, to enable an organization to move. So work with those frontiersmen, work with those pioneers. Um, the second is speeds increasing and, and time frames are shrinking. So I, I described a journey over 18 months. Um, Richard, as we were preparing for this, shared a, a uh, academic paper um, and with apologies to my business school professors, it was the first strategy academic paper I read front to back. Um, it was, yeah, I, 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 I quite actually enjoyed it. Um, and it described, it described the page you had that described the, 
the genesis of the frameworks. Um, one that stood out to me, I think it was working with GE over the course of 10 years and iterations, and then they came out with this brilliant framework. And I just thought, 10 years, holy shit. Um, you can't, very, very simply, you, you can't work in 10 years. You can't work in, you need to be able to work on a, and iterate and contribute on a quarterly basis. And not quarterly because it's a quarter, not quarter because it's financial reporting, but quarterly because that's about how fast things move. And so, so think about iterative frameworks, iterative strategy. How are we bringing out, consolidating the pieces we have, getting those out, supporting the organizations to be able to digest and move with them, recognizing it's not full baked, fully baked, but bringing it out and being part of that journey. Um, and, and how do you adapt to shorter timeframes? Um, I, would, I would note, by the way, on that, on that chart, which shows when frameworks were, were generated, I saw that the, um, the, the business bar, the orange one, went to zero. Um, well, strategic decisions didn't stop, right? It's just nobody's taking the time to put it into a framework anymore. If I, if, if I had the time to put, put my thinking into a framework, then I've already missed the opportunity. Um, the role of AI in strategy. Um, the, the one thing that, that I would emphasize here is this fundamentally changes how and where you can compete. Right, we used to, uh, you know, one of my favorite things, we'd look at what are, what are our capabilities, what, you know, what market do I wanna be in, what capability do I wanna bring, what's my competitive advantage? Um, if I don't have a competitive advantage today, I just think about how can I go download it? Um, right? the, the ability to create and adjust and adapt and the time frame that happens fundamentally changes how I think about competition, how I think about market entry, how I think about what we're going to go do. Um, and, that, that changes the personas and the roles of the market participants, of the competitors, of the stakeholders. Um, so how, how do you think about a much more fluid environment in the role of, of strategy in deciding that? I think that's my signal to wrap up, but I got one more. Um, so if we can go back a page, I don't know how to do that with this. Back to the question page. And the last one here, which I think is really Critical. Um, you know, when we, when we think about the, the gross share matrix is one of my yeah, the two by two. We all, we all use it. It's, it's built into at least the three of us from BCG here. Um, uh, that, is, that is broadly applicable. It applies generally and to almost everyone. I think about my journey, my strategy with a large corporation, my strategy with a startup, and my strategy with a PE firm all had to be different. All three of them looked at the same environment, the same message. I'm gonna pretty much say the same deck and presentation from me. And they all had three different strategic responses. One of them was started out at, hey, it's very interesting, we love it, we can't do it, spin it out. The other one was go fund it, grow it, Play for, the, play for the next decade, and the next one was, yeah, I, I, we're not gonna put any capital into it, I need EBITDA in the next, in the next two years to manage an exit, right? Three different responses to the same thing. Your framework actually is, is, is I, I don't believe it's going to be a general framework anymore. You need a framework for your audience. Who's your audience? How are they gonna think about the problem? How, how are we going to structure it for them? And because the governance and, and the stakeholder motivations are going to drive as much of that, that strategic thinking and, and structure. Um, and so start, to start that segmentation early. All right, thanks very much, JT. So let's, um, let's move to, the, um, to you now for uh, questions and, and comments. And so that I can see the clock and participate, um, Jeff and Michael have kindly uh, offered to wander around with the microphones. I think the microphones are over there, uh, Jeff and Michael, with the AV guys. But um, shall, shall we start here, if you could uh, speak loudly while we get the mics? All right, Mark, let me give you mine. 
Thank you. So thank you for this very insightful session. So Richard has shown us that uh, academics have been quite active in contributing frameworks to practice. So my question is, to what extent are the frameworks contributed a complete representation of the theory we might want to reach practice? To what extent is this a problem? And to what extent is this a sufficiently large problem that we might want to reconsider the incentive structure of uh, research active academics? Thanks, Helena. I think, and this goes back to what Zia was saying, we need to understand how frameworks are used in practice. So I represented them in their stylized academic form. In the field, they're not used like that. So I referred to um, the affordances of strategy frameworks. Sarah Kaplan, Paul Jaszkowski, and other people in the strategy as practice community are looking at how people work with frameworks. They misuse them. They abuse them. They manipulate them. In fact, talking of the um, BCG matrix, I well remember a marketing and a sales director. I sat in a strategy workshop way back early in my career, and the sales director undermined the marketing director by saying, ah, the left axis on the BCG matrix shouldn't be that. It should be on the, right, on the, on, on the other axis. He was wrong, but that didn't matter. In the politics of strategic decision-making, again, something that Zia was referring to, that was effective. So the use of the tools is likely not to be representative. They are part of the game, but a very useful part. They're just weapons. They're hammers which you can use as screwdrivers or something like that. Yeah? And so I don't know. I thank you for your point. We need research on how the tools are used in practice. Questions? Yeah. Over there. Okay. Oh. Can I go? Yeah, go. All right. Um, so thank you so much for this session, which I, I really enjoyed. Um, and I think queued up two points that I've been thinking uh, so far in this, this wonderful conference. Um, so I'm, I'm going to use this as a platform to say, one, we need more qualitative research and strategy. And two, uh, qualitative research on strategy topics is not, in fact, OB. It's strategy research. Um, and so I'm going to build on several of the things, Zia, that you mentioned, uh, which really made me think of a lot of the research that's been done by qualitative researchers in this room and, and elsewhere, um, and perhaps provide a bit of a reading list uh, on, on things that folks should be reading if they're interested in these questions. So the idea that strategy is a continuous emergent process, um, Robert Bergelman, of course, did some foundational work on this. Uh, my colleague, Sonali Shah, has, has looked at uh, industry development. Um, in terms of more entrepreneurial settings, fast-moving companies, Kathy Eisenhardt, of course, was a pioneer. But more recently, um, Jax Kirtley, looking at pivots, and Rory McDonald uh, also does work in this area. Um, organizational and cultural factors in strategy. So the two Marys that I'm uh, sitting with have definitely looked at at that. Um, but also in the M&A context and in alliances, we have a lot of really interesting qualitative work. Uh, Julian Birkinshaw has done some. Um, Chris Bingham, Kuhn Heimrichs have looked at qualitative issues in uh, post-merger integration, which is uh, very interesting work. Imagination and play, we talked about. Uh, Violina uh, was speaking about this yesterday. Um, and Richard already anticipated my comment about uh, strategy frameworks in use and, and the work that Sarah Kaplan and Paula Jarzabkowski have done. But I would also mention Callan Anthony, who was uh, Mary's student, who looks at how investment bankers use the information tools that come to them and the degree to which they do or don't understand the calculations um, behind those information services. So. Uh, I guess in closing, I would say the qualitative research community welcomes converts. Uh, Rajshree Agarwal is one of our most esteemed, right? Right? We've won you over. Um, so come on in. The water's fine. We'd love to have you in our uh, side of strategy research. Thank you. This gentleman just there. <laughs>
Great, okay, two comments. One, building on that one, I really, JT and Zia, appreciated the underlying of the continuous nature of strategy today. Fast cycle times, I think, still if I think about the first day, I still felt there was a lot of desire to stay close to the big decision making, which is part of strategy, but I'd also make the connection, what you talked about with AI, is only gonna speed up those cycle times. So I think if we wanna move practice and our research closer, um, I would just underline what you said. Doesn't necessarily have to be qualitative, but it, 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 that can also help. Um, okay, then my, my bigger comment is for Richard. So I, I appreciate the positive messaging, and I agree the ecosystem we broadly have here you know, produces deep understanding, and, and a few of us people spit out useful frameworks I guess my question would be, what's the underlying production process in our ecosystem? What's the role of academic research actually in that? And I'll just give one data point from, from my school, so Peter Zemsky from INSEAD. So like our, our most effective framework producers are the Chan Kim and Renee Morbun, and like contrast their work on fair process. If you don't know them, they spent decades working away on refereed publications on procedural justice, out of which came that framework. On the other hand, all their stuff about Blue Ocean you know, didn't come out of their refereed publications, or I, I'm not sure whose, but it came out of teaching strategy, and actually Chan came from Michigan. He had done lots of work from CK, working with companies on core competence, and just that whole milieu, and it came out of that, and I don't think that one was particularly linked to, to academic research. So I just think there's something to look at where where these frameworks are actually coming from and how closely they're actually tied to the refereed research. Those are my comments. Yeah, perhaps I can make brief comments on that. I mean, I think um, with, with the stuff we showed today, uh, I think you'd agree, Richard, there isn't a lot of research out there on where the ideas come from, how they're used in practice, how they evolve in practice, which ones are increasing in use. Uh, you know, the field work in strategy, the collaborative field work on the reality of the, the on practitioner reality. I think that that to me seems like a very interesting potential area of research. Perhaps it's not as sexy to some as the big, the big conceptual issues strategy, but it's 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 necessary for the health of the field. I think so that we can evolve and learn. Other other comments? Oh, yes. Uh, thanks very much. That was really helpful. There's a fabulous article in Organisation Studies by a guy called Carton who looks at the way in which the Blue Ocean strategy emerged. One of the things which is important in that process is in fact the um, chief executive of Philips was quite influential as a big strategy uh, transformation project that Kim was very much involved in. Philips said, uh, that this guy said, compare, and the canvas was partly the product of comparing. Um, but the Carton Organization Studies paper 2020 is very insightful. Yes. Hi, Costas Marchidis, London Business School. Uh, just a thought, uh, I, I found it useful in my career to differentiate between managerially relevant research versus managerially useful research. And let me explain why I found that useful. I think every publication I see in our journals, SMJ, AMJ, Strategy Science, I will call it managerially relevant. They all, all these publications, they deal with issues that managers are interested in, and uh, you know they are tackled in a very you know scientific way and come up with certain answers that any manager would find relevant. However, is it useful? in the sense that it helps managers think about the business and solve their problems. And the answer is not necessarily, it's relevant, but to make it useful, you need a transformation process. You need to take a lot of relevant research, put it together, apply creativity and come up with something beautiful that managers will find useful. And it's two different types of knowledge and requires two different types of academics or producers of that knowledge. The analogy I use is in radical innovation where you see small startup firms inventing the radical new product, but it's usually the big firms that come in and scale it up into the mass market kind of product that generates most of the value and so on. So, and, and there is a reason why the skills required for invention are different from the skills required for scaling up. It's the same in academia. The skills required 
for producing managerially relevant research are different from the ones we need to produce managerially useful research. I think all of our colleagues in academia, they are fantastic in producing managerial relevant research. And that's why we've had calls over the last 50 years, change the incentives, bring managers into advisors how to write articles and so on. All of this advice, you know, we've had it for 50 years and we've never taken it up because we don't need it. You know, managerially relevant research, we're doing it very, very well and it's doing just fine. What you need to think is how can we develop people that are able to take this managerially relevant research and convert it through some creativity process into managerially useful research. And I think that's where the bottleneck and that's where the change needs to happen. That's just an observation, not a question. Thank you very much. Other yes, questions? Yes, here. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Please, where are you? Uh, Rafaela Saadun from Hara Business School. So I wanted to just say thank you for a very interesting discussion. Um, I think what I took away from your comments is the importance of the organizational um, absorption of a strategic idea. Each of you man said something about the importance of the political process, uh, the buy-in process, as well as the bottom-up ideas coming through, which are all organizational um, dynamics, I think. Yet, Zia, when you were talking, I couldn't help but notice uh, that you, at some point, said, Look, this is strategy, it's not execution. By all means, it's not execution. And I'm wondering if, in a way, what we're doing is a little bit limiting our influence by deciding to be more on the framework and conceptual ideas rather than more on the dynamic process that explains why an idea gets, up, gets executed or modified by the organization. And I feel there is a little bit of, of, of an artificial distinction between strategy and organization that perhaps we could gain more relevance if we were able to integrate these two things more closely. The second point I wanted to make is you have not, none, none, in none of the discussions, I see a big problem in the demand side as well. There is tremendous demand for ideas, but there is also tremendous demand for easy ideas or bullet, you know, things that can be done uh, very quickly. And there is a market for that that is often lucrative. So I think if the, what is the role of academics in engaging with that demand for things that are maybe not as deep, but they give you a promise of a quick wins, and I wonder if part of our incentives problems is that we have that option. You know, we can spend 10 years studying our ideas or we can spend 10 years marketing our ideas and not making it deeper. So that's more for a discussion for the audience. Martin, could I just comment, just on your, on your first point, um, I, I absolutely a thousand percent believe and see it everywhere, strategy in of itself is, is kind of irrelevant. <laughs> uh, the strategy needs to lead to impact. And that impact involves a multidisciplinary approach. And that's organizational stuff, it's, it's all these other pieces. And so how do you, as academics, work with your colleagues? And I mean, are those lines blurred? Do you interact? And, and when you kind of come out with these frameworks, how do you think about it? Plus also, I'd love to learn about frameworks that take into account the political and organizational impact on strategic decision making. Um, I haven't seen anything that, that maybe it's, it's too ambiguous to, to take that into account, uh, but, but that's where things break down, and, and it has to be interdisciplinary from that perspective. Yeah, a, a comment on the same uh, thing, which is a, a sort of a pull that I feel that I don't have an easy fix for, which is as things become less big set piece, conceptual, uh, episodic decisions, but more a continuous process of deciding and iterating, all of these sort of contextual factors become more important. And, and therefore, you know, I feel that the, the, uh, the itch for more clues to, as to system design. In other words, uh, if, if the historic bias of the field is how to make big set piece decisions well, um, you know, perhaps that needs complementing with more aspects of holistic system design for this ongoing iteration process. I, I've, to some extent, in my own practice, I've had to cobble that together because I, I couldn't, I couldn't find a lot on that. I could find pieces of it in the different subdisciplines of organisation change strategy, but I put it together into something I call the strategy stack, which is the system that animates all, all of those levels. 
and doesn't just focus on the big set piece decision. Uh, that's a really good way to look at it. I, I think it is a system design issue. Um, and, and I think that's a good phrase that reflects what I have to do to actually design and implement a strategy. It, it is a system problem. Okay, other comments? Yes. Yes, my, my question. Okay. Alfonso Gambardella from Bocconi University, Milan. So my question to, to Zia is very related to what uh, Raffaella said. Uh, I was also intrigued by your story that strategy happens uh, uh, throughout uh, the organization and you actually said it's not implementation, it's really strategy. So the question I have for you is, uh, do you think that at those levels, people are sufficiently prepared to make strategic decisions. Because uh, in, at least in my school, when we go to uh, programs for that level, we go much more operational. So to use Jan's uh, language yesterday, we go much more to content uh, than to choices. So the question number one is uh, whether you think uh, there is good preparation in making strategic decisions also at that level of the organizations, and two, whether if and whether we in business schools should then also teach much more strategy or process uh, at those levels as well. Yeah, it's a good question, and maybe JT can also comment on this from his experience. Um, I don't think it matters, because that's where, so let's take an org chart. There's the CEO, there's his uh, or her direct report, and then there's the direct reports there. So let's say there's an EVP at the management team and SVPs underneath them and VP, I mean, you can put. So the VP level or the SVP level that are running maybe multi-billion dollar businesses, of course they have to be ready. Of course they have to be trained. Um, and that's where the bulk of the middle management is that is actually taking the strategic direction that's done at the executive level and saying, what the hell do I do with this? Um, and some of those, I mean, I tell you over and over again in the example that I gave on the transformation for the SaaS journey, the incentive compensation structure that had to change across the entire company for a company that's delivering a SaaS product versus an on-premise product is night and day. That conversation is done three levels down by somebody that's driving that. Or the pricing strategy right, is, is hugely important. So yes, I completely agree with you. It, it is incorrect to say there's strategy and then there's execution. It is much more of a continuum. And even the system point that Martin made is the right one. Even when you're in so-called execution, you're making strategic decisions. So it, it's just, it, it's, it's not a thinking and approach that I've ever found useful. The big, the big shots who get paid a lot of money will do strategy, and then the worker bees will do execution. That's just not the way it happens. I, I, I think that's right. I think the um, and one thing, Zia, that we talked about when we were preparing for this is um, those intermediate decisions, the, the, the top level, and I think you alluded to this with your, your mention of the CEO, and I, I certainly felt this in my environment. Um, those strategic decisions are, they're often made in like 30 minutes over lunch, um, right? And, and it, it, that's just very practically, like I don't have time for an army of people to think about it and bring, I mean, by the time they brought the recommendation, I probably already had the decision. Um, you, Richard, you mentioned that, you know, there was a role here of justifying managerial decisions almost with structure and frameworks. And, and in, in the market that we see, the increased privatization of companies, like, I don't, I don't have to justify as much. Um, those decisions get made frequently. We rely more on experimentation, recovery. Um, and so now those decisions, they're made in 30 minutes. They're on a basis of a combination of frameworks and education and experience and all those things flow into it. We need people to come in capable to understand that, but I almost think they need to, be, they need to have a broad enough understanding so that they can see how they fit in, that they can, they can see why leaders are making decisions the way they're making them and they can get on board and carry along, not so that they can do the, the groundwork to figure it out. Um, Richard, coming back to you, I think you had a comment on uh, Costas' question. Well, uh, only briefly. We, oh, excuse me. We slightly set up a competition, a horse race between consultants and academics. But one of the things that, when you talked about relevance and usefulness, Costas, and when we raised the Kim and Mo Bourne 
um, experience is many of the, many academics work in what we call in the fragmented trading zones. In other words, they're working very closely with consultants or industrialists, as Kim was with Philips. Or many academics are hybrids. And this is the one of the things I would uh, tweaks I would make to our model is to encourage more consultants to come in and do PhDs. Many of the most influential people on the list of innovators that we've been looking at have had previously a business or consulting background, including Dan Shandell, who worked in engineering and then for SRI consultants before becoming an academic. So it's an artificial distinction. Most of us are hybrids, and in fact, that's how Martin introduced us all. I'm the least hybrid here, to be honest, but still. Um, yes, I think Bruce had a, a comment, a question. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, maybe this lady first then. All right. Uh, since Yana Drabanzo from NYU. I want to go back to, to Costa's question uh, about managerially relevant versus useful and kind of reframe it a little bit in terms of accessibility. Right? I think the comment he, that Costas was making is that some of the research that people in this room produce is not accessible because it's very, very specific, very sort of jargon. Uh, Leiden. But there's another aspect of accessibility, and, the, and that's the fact that all of our research, or most of our research, 99% of our research is behind a paywall uh, that's being charged by third-party organizations that made sense in the 60s and 70s and 80s and don't make so much sense today. It can be, sub, you know, in certain situations, it's a, it's a professional organization, and may, maybe that makes sense, but some of the paywalls are the publishers. And I'm just curious to hear from, I'm, I'm not under the impression that practitioners would be reading academic research on a daily basis if it were really truly freely accessible. But I'm curious whether you think that that paywall is sort of an additional barrier to uh, to 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 the sort of translation process. I, I don't I don't think so. I, 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 there's enough money around to to spend uh, to to get ideas. So I don't think the paywall in of itself. But I do believe that. How you communicate, I mean, would you go make a TikTok video on a framework? Maybe you should. Uh, it may get more traction uh, than, than in an academic journal if you want to get it out there. I think one thing to Costa's point as well that, that has always been useful is illustrating a strategic point with an example or a case study. That always gets people's kind of uh, attention. This company did this, this is what they were after, this is what they were trying to do. That, which that can lead to a framework or an approach on how we can think about that problem, that works. But if you start with the framework first, um, that's always been, in my experience, a little bit of an issue. So examples matter a lot because people can relate to that kind of a situation. But I don't think the paywall has any impact. Martin, just w one real quick point on that, and I'll make it. I, I, I agree, like, it's not the financial component. The paywall doesn't matter. Um, the time it gets to get it through a process, you know, get it out to market, by the time it gets out there, it's already too late, right? And, it, you know, if, if, if you're not within the last few months, I, it's, it's just marginally relevant. Um, I, I, had a, I had a brief discussion with a, a leading mining CEO and close friend of mine. He said, every mining CEO right now is struggling to see the signal and understand it. They're dealing with AI, they're dealing with a geopolitical disaster, they're dealing with you know, fundamental, you know, slow permitting timeframes. They have a long list of challenges they have not seen that we haven't experienced in the past. But they, they, they so they need it. Everybody needs it. They can't get it, and it's not prompt and relevant in today if it doesn't have all those, if it doesn't bring all these today's issues together. That, that, so time, time's your, time is your enemy. Bruce? Switch on the mic, I think it's off. Thank you, so. I, I teach, uh, you'd think I would know know this by now. But <laughs> the, um, so thank you very much for doing this panel. Uh, it's always, you know, interesting to get into a discussion like this and figure out what the roles are and the contributions are. And it's, I know you guys are two CEOs of busy people and academics are, 
are busy. And Marvin, you're, uh, you know, I've seen you in action before. It's, it's, it's great to see you bring this to us, and thanks for that. The, um, you know, there's two, there's two issues here which are related. Um, and I just want to make you first an observation. That as academics, and I don't wish to be sound tar horrible on this, there's different ways which, which we get engaged in consulting ourselves to a, to a company. And, and one is, you know, I, I have lots of, fr lots of colleagues who do very technical consulting, like in AI, which is, you know, down, you know, deep mind, which you, uh, as he has mentioned, you know, definitely, you know, you'd go to deep mind rather than go to, you know, maybe a McKinsey or whatever, even though they got 5,000, 6,000 people in India working on, on various things uh, uh, for them. And, and then there's people who's doing very top level work, you know, often in direct conversations with CEOs, et cetera, CK, Prahlad, that's the CK we heard earlier, or there's other people in this room, I'll give them a little wink on my left and my right, say, they do this, uh, they do this as well, and they have those engagements. Or so you give a, a talk to a, to a, you know, a strategy meeting, and you're well paid for, for that particular uh, time. So there's the, you talk about incentives, and the work, the work side is also incentives on the academic side of what they get they get involved. I think my guess is that Marvin's aspirations are more than that, and that is this flow of ideas back and forth between the, between the two. Um, and, you know, I, and, and I, you know, all of us have that experience, and I remember early on when I used to work on this stuff uh, on knowledge, et cetera, and flow, you get invited, you get invited by a, a well-known large uh, uh, consulting company. I, I, McKinsey uh, uh, was early in, in, somewhat early in this. Before I actually had a, I looked at the, I was looking at this tr transfer issue, and I was invited to a company, a consulting company, and to look where is their knowledge, and, their and they're supposed to deposit all the reports, and, all, and you get there, and all the shelves were empty, you know, because no one was, so it was a big transformation over the past 20 years about the, you know, more of a codification of knowledge and how that's being done, and better management of those, of those uh, ideas. But I remember that we had to sign a, an agreement that we would not, you know, what's that called when you sign an agreement? To, uh, to you? NDA. Right, so this thing you would not do, you know, for the NDA, which we've all signed many, many times, I'm looking around here. But McKinsey never, you know, uh, other hand, we never asked McKinsey to sign their NDAs on the whole, the whole thing. And one of the reasons why is because we are, a, we are a, as, as, as academic institutions, our job actually is to disseminate knowledge on that. So there's something which is really important on this issue is to keep in mind that there is this different obligation on academics on, uh, on this one issue. I want to say one last thing on this and, and as a seed to the next panel on it. So when you look at the knowledge issues now and you look at yourselves as consultants and so on and by looking at uh, you know, what you're going to do forward, just tell me how AI plays out for, for consulting companies. Um, so uh, I'm speculating on the knowledge issue uh, uh, and whether it's a good thing for a bad thing, whether your skill levels go up for your demand or your skill levels for demand right. go down. Uh, that, we're actually already over time, so that one will have to be over coffee, I think, Bruce, that last question. But um, yeah, my, the biggest sin in life as a consultant is to go over time, so let me, let me wrap up. But I, I just want to make one final comment, which is thank you to the organizers for the courage to put on this session, because it's sort of awkward, isn't it? I mean, the, the language of these guys and what we were talking about in the other sessions, it doesn't naturally connect. But we do have to keep the flow of ideas and people going. We have to figure out a way of making meetings like this so magnetic that you call me and say, can I be there, as opposed to me pleading with you to, uh, to, to, to be here. And, and, and it's something about, in a sense, taking the idea of open strategy and applying it on the, on the field of strategy. I think it's a major agenda here. Rich is interested in that. Michael, Miles, myself, Jeff are interested in that. Let's, let's continue the dialogue. Thank you very much. You. See you back at 10.30 uh, for a very different panel, although I think it's going to be actually quite related. So.